morning, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real honor to be here, uh, and really great to see so many clients uh, at this KPMG function. Um, as Devin has said, um, I've got the unenviable task of literally taking you guys through, in 15 or 20 minutes, the changes in the budget speech. Um, and whilst Tim has done that for me in 10 seconds, um, uh, I'm going to try and do my best to, to try and summarize in 20 minutes. Um, what I thought about doing is, uh, sorry, let's get there. In, 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 instead of just talking about uh, some of the changes, I thought I needed to just bring some context to some of the things I think Tim really touched on, and that's the issues around growth and infrastructure development. And, 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 and I thought a quick snapshot of where the collections targets um, have come from and where's the revenue been generated would be really useful for, um, for the audience. So I'm going to just try and take, so, take folks through that, then I'm going to talk through some of the amendments, and then obviously try and conclude with some, um, some concluding remarks and some of our thoughts. People probably want to know what our thoughts are. Well, I think you're going to have to unfortunately wait till, till the end, uh, because it, I think the amendments are quite, um, quite far-reaching in some instances. If we could just, just look at uh, the first, very first slide, just look, it looks at the path, where's, where's our revenue coming from? And there's obviously four sort of main sources of, of, of taxes that we've got. We've got personal income tax, which one can see is the main source of income. We then have corporate tax, um, we have VAT, and then we've got a whole lot of range of other sources of taxation. I think what's interesting is that the, the, the total collections for 2013, 2012, 2013, and these are data which have already been um, available and, and these are confirmed, came in at 813 billion rand. And the targeted collections, I'm just talking tax revenue collections, for 2013, 2014, which is the current year, we know was is sitting at around 872 billion. I think the thing that caught many, many people by surprise was obviously a very bullish view by the minister that he's going to exceed those collection targets. Um, and, and, and in some way, and I think in, 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 in his words, almost by a billion rand. And I think that really goes to um, the hard work that's being done by, I guess, the, the, the administration, in, in particular SARS, in collecting the revenue. Um, what's interesting is that company taxation has really come down from the previous years. And I think that's really telling in terms of um, where the economy is. Um, this year it seems the pro 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 projections are going to be much better, but certainly the past two years we've seen the decline in company taxation. Uh, if you look at then uh, the companies that have been registered, there's about 2.2 million. For me the interesting point here on this little slide is really the, the, the small business. Uh, there's 600,000 corporate taxpayers that have actually been assessed, but there's only around 100,000 um, of small business corporations that are actually part of the system, which, which I think is, is where a lot of Tim's talk is around and where I think a lot of the intention of this budget from the tax side really will, will come through. Okay. Um, if you look at personal income tax, sorry, one quick side there. Uh, personal income tax, it is the largest source of income. Um, uh, and, and I know that this often surprises people to find that um, it's the workers that are actually paying a lot of the taxes that's going to the FISC. And again, if you look at some of the, 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 sort of the stats around that, it's where's the main sources of that income coming from? Um, you look at certain industries, and quite surprisingly, it's within the service industry. Now, if you actually look at that slide, and I, I don't know if you guys have a better line of sight than me, but it's majority of, those, of that income from personal income tax doesn't come from mining, doesn't come from manufacturing. And if we're going to be creating jobs, we need to shift that pie, in my view, um, so that a lot more of that PAYE and that income comes from those industries, as opposed to the service industries. Okay. If we're going to be creating the six million jobs, I think that's where the focus really needs to be. Okay. And this is just historical data, guys, so just bear that in mind. Uh, again, VAT, uh, a very big contributor. In fact, one of my partners was challenging me in terms of these figures. Well, these are actually real, Ferdy, um, and I have the data confirmed by SARS. Uh, so, so this is the net VAT sort of amounts that have been collected. The slide that I've got here is that it's just largest payments by sector. Again, interesting because you'll see there mining doesn't even make it to the slide. And we know that there's been a lot of talk around mining and the fact that it employs over 500,000 jobs doesn't even make it to the slide. However, what is interesting though, and I've, I haven't put this slide on, is that this one talks about the payments by sector. Um, there's another st uh, data that, that, that shows um, the, 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 um, uh, not, not the payments but the actual inputs. And you'll find that mining features quite high. And that's because of the capital spend that does seem to be going back into mining, a bit of a question mark. But that's positive to show that where there's inputs being, being claimed, it's, it's within an industry that obviously is hopefully starting to spend a bit of money on capital projects. 
Again, this is just raw data, and again, we'd like to obviously see a lot more of the manufacturing guys and a lot more of the mining guys coming, uh, you know, ha having more space on the, on, on the pie chart as such. So that was really a, a background in terms of where are, where are we drawing our resources from? Clearly, it's not in the uh, mining sector, it's not in the manufacturing sector, it's not in those sectors where there's a lot of job and job opportunities. And so what does the out outlook really look in terms of some of, the, some of the proposed amendments? So let's try and take a look at them. Um, and let's start off with the most easy one. Uh, I guess it's pretty common cause that we're all pretty smiling after the minister's speech. Um, apart from the little, I think, heart attack he had when he, when he cracked the joke that uh, rates were going up. Um, uh, the good news was that obviously there's been no uh, increase in, in, in the marginal rate. Uh, there was also some speculation around the fact that there might have been an increase on um, some sort of wealth tax being introduced. Uh, and all of this didn't come through, which I think uh, in, in the main has really been good. And so the data around the thresholds, I think we, you know, we can look at them. They're pretty much uh, following the norm. Um, and, and, and what we often find is we find the shift in terms of the fiscal drag of the various bands. This was an interesting slide that actually formed part of the, the budget speech, and thanks to Carolyn for helping me put this together. But it really shows you, I think, uh, where does the, the amendments in terms of the, 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 the thresholds have the biggest impact? Um, so for most folks, I'm, I'm sure sitting around the table, we're going to not hopefully be at the lower end. Uh, but that's where the biggest impact is. So if you look at it, for those people that are earning around 75000 um, uh, your, your, your actual impact in terms of the tax that you're going to get back has, is around 45%. Now that's quite meaningful, I think, for those people at that lower level. Uh, and, and I think a very clear message in terms of the hidden, hidden stats that's coming through here. And as you go down the scale, you can see that obviously the higher income, the impact is far, far less. Um, so a little interesting stat I, I thought uh, shows why ultimately I'll, 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 I'll sort of share the view as to why this is very much a middle of the ground, centralist kind of a budget, uh, certainly for me from, from a tax point of view. I think from an individual tax side, there's been some really good stuff um, uh, that, that, that's come through, apart from the fact that the rates haven't been increased. Um, the first one is the, is the issue around the retirement reform on uh, your lump sum benefits. Uh, that rate's been increased from 315000 to 500,000. Again, very positive because that becomes a tax-free component. And a lot, again, is being driven at the lower income bracket level. Um, the interesting development is this, this new, new proposal on tax-exempt preferred savings accounts, um, which, uh, um, again, is a very good initiative to try and drive some of the savings that we're trying to encourage. For me, I do question the, the, the thresholds. 30,000 per annum, once or 500,000 seems very low. And the question is, will it really make a big impact in the longer term? But I think a good start, and, and hopefully the details will come through in terms of what this will entail. Will this be in addition to the current interest rate exemptions? Uh, will there be different levels for older folks, younger folks? Let's see what, uh, what comes through. But again, I think a very positive, interesting move there. Um, there's been some developments around phasing in of car allowances for car manufacturers. Quite limited, but I think for those people that, that's going to be impacted, quite, quite a significant one. Um, and then there's the valuation of fringe benefit. I, I'm not a POI expert, but I understand that this is one area where there's been a lot of confusion and complications around how you determine that fringe benefit value. And I understand that these proposals are going to be made really to try and ease and um, uh, clarify a lot of uncertainties in this particular space, especially when it comes to shared residential accommodation, etc. Okay. So, so that's really personal income tax. I mean, um, overall fairly good news, I would think. Um, uh, a lot of the, the, the bulk of the, the, the proposed changes, whether it's actual technical amendments or policy statements, really centers around corporate tax. And, and I've lumped those together both in terms of corporate and international tax. So let's start off with them. And the way I've done the presentation is to give you guys a sense of what I call the Annex C amendments, um, which are the technical amendments uh, versus the Chapter 4 ones. And so we'll get on to the Chapter 4 ones. But just to, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from, the Annex C ones are the ones where uh, you know, you need to go into the finer details of the legislation to really get the full impact of what are these proposed amendments. And again, without having the legislation, it's very difficult to say how it will pan out. But these are, I think, in clear, direct response to uh, a lot of the feedback that um, Treasury would have received on the, the current version of the legislation. And, and I'm very happy to say that some of these were actually promoted by us uh, in terms of motivating for these amendments. So without having to lose a lot of the audience, I think the, the, the category is around, firstly, the question around third-party back shares. This is really deals with um, preference share funding. 
and um, it's a very, very specific section in the Act, um, which basically tries to reclassify, as we know, dividend income to interest income. And it's a very challenging entity of wooden section. I mean, this whole area has been, for those of you that play in the funding area, know that it's been a very complex area that has been subject to significant changes certainly over the past 12, 18 months or so. And what they've tried to do is um, actually bring some certainty on some of these uh, amendments in terms of third-party back share. So there's really three categories, and we go through them very quickly. The first one is that um, where there's been a refinancing of the equity share that was actually used um, um, uh, for, or, or that was part of the funding, um, and if you try and refinance those, the legislation in its current wording there was, was debatable whether you can actually do the refinancing without reclassifying effectively the dividend income to interest income. So I think that proposed amendment will hopefully clear that, and again, that's, that must be seen as being positive. A second issue was really around a practical issue of uh, opera uh, operating companies in the context of uh, prospecting operations, and we've had real-life examples of these. Remember, we want to try and encourage prospecting operations uh, because we are ultimately a resource-based um, uh, based economy. And um, the, the, the one of the sections um, uh, didn't talk necessarily to the funding that might be applied under the preferentiary arrangements to a prospecting company because technically it wasn't an operating company. So what the amendments are seeking now to do is to then include prospecting companies as hopefully an operating company. Again, good because we want to foster this part of the economy. And then the third one was what, what is what we call limited pledges in certain, uh, in respect of third-party back shares. Effectively, this allows funders uh, a, a bit more flexibility in, in terms of ple pledging the shares, the equity shares in, in the operating company where there's a pressure structure. Again, there was a lot of anomalies and, and, and uncertainties as to whether that pledging would, uh, would, would reclassify um, the funding. So again, I don't want to go into too much detail here, very, very complicated area. Um, linked to this then is this whole area around the limitation of interest. Uh, and we know that we've gone through significant changes. In fact, currently the, the law as we stand will kick in on 1 April, but it's, uh, we're going through a 23K process, for those of you that are, are aware of some of these provisions. And the new section 23N, there's been some refinements which come in with effect for 1 April. It's a whole new regime. It takes away the discretion for allowing interest on these reorganizations, typically your highly geared type transactions. Um, the concern here was that the formula that was being used when you ran the numbers did, just simply didn't work. You had to bring in, if you brought in prior assessed losses, there were certainly limitations which um, brought down the potential or, or the, and the quantum of the interest that was allowed as a deduction. And what they're trying to do is take away some of those anomalies by making the formula read a bit better and also increase the threshold of the interest that can ultimately be claimed. I guess the challenge we're going to be facing is that 1 April is around the corner. When will these amend amendments come through? What's the form and shape of them and what impact they're going to have effectively on these reorganizations and the gearing around that is, again, something we're going to have, we're going to, have to wait and see. Um, research and development, another very interesting area. We've been doing a lot of work in this particular space. So my fellow partner, Mohammed Jada, is here. Um, and and th th there was certainly an issue around clinical trials. This is really impacts the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and the debate was really around whether these trials would qualify for uh, the, the R&D incentive. And again, um, some th certainly is a very positive move by the, 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 sort of the minister announcing that these will now be included as part of the regime. Again, removing uncertainty in terms of where um, these, these, these incentives can be claimed, especially those incentives which, um, where, the, where, where those trials are run on, for instance, medications that may not end up being used in South Africa, but be, being used overseas. And that's important. That's where this amendment really tries to give another hidden message, is to say we will allow those trials to take place in South Africa. We will try and allow those R&Ds to come through, um, even if ultimately they don't end up being applied in, in this country. And Mohammed can certainly feel more questions later on on that issue. Um, on the international tax front, there's been two or three issues. I know that, Tim, you mentioned the issue on Axcon. Um, certainly, I'm not an expert on Axcon, but we've got somebody here that can maybe feel, we can feel that, you know, that question to them. But the two or three international tax issues are really are, are, are relate around to secondary adjustment for transfer pricing. Again, we know that transfer pricing has been up, you know, has been pretty fluid recently. The, the, the old sort of rules have, have, have changed significantly. And there was an issue around where there's an adjustment, it would be treated as a loan. And there was a debate of whether that adjustment, if it's treated as a loan, what do you do with it? Because it's not a real loan, it's a fictitious loan. 
Uh, and so the amendment now says that, well, it will no longer be treated as a loan, but that transfer pricing adjustment will effectively be deemed to be a dividend um, or a capital distribution. Uh, and hence, obviously, the punitive measure will kick in through that mechanism. Again, the interesting debate is how do you apply that because all, all that the policy re statements really say is that uh, those, um, uh, uh, the, the, the definition or the distinction between dividends and capital distribution will ultimately turn on the facts of each case. So again, a lot to, to, to look out for in terms of legislation. There's a high tax exemption for CFCs, control fund companies. Those are these multinational groups with lots of offshore operations. There's a 75% threshold that used to apply for on, on a per subsidiary level. The legislation is being amended to effectively introduce a grouping type arrangement so that the net effect is that if the net uh, high tax of the entire CFC aggregated meets the requirements, you'll qualify for the exemption. Again, I think good policy statement there, fostering investments by South African companies, um, venturing outside of South Africa, but again, the devil's going to be probably in the detail in terms of how that's going to be implemented. I think first time, in terms of group taxation, we'll be looking at something which is quite unique, actually, to South Africa, because we don't have group, ta group taxation, as we know. And then this is the Chapter 4 stuff, which I thought was, for me, the, 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 the more positive stuff. These are policy statements, accepted, not the technical detail, but things as to what the trends are going to be. Uh, first one, for a fairly benign one, public benefit organizations, a real big issue around the fact that we want our PBOs to be self-sufficient and not dependent upon the state or, um, you know, or, or, the, or, or, or the donors as such, and allowing them to, 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 to use the, accumulate the capital has, 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 had, has had some challenges because there was a requirement to distribute 75% of those funds on an annual basis. Those requirements seem to be relaxed as long as certain other undertakings are made, like, for example, the fact that at some point in time the capital will be distributed for the good causes that that PBO was set up for. Um, and here's the important stuff that I think um, will hopefully talk to the issue around job development. Small and medium enterprise development. These recommendations, some of them are coming straight from uh, the, Dennis committee, sorry, the Davis Committee's um, uh, first round report on small to medium uh, uh, enterprises. The first one is really around small and medium enterprise development. Um, the minister has said that he's going to make available around six billion to support this particular initiative. How that's going to happen, we're going to wait and see. Um, but it's around promoting and encouraging entrepreneurs. So very good policy statements, promotion of entrepreneurship, and excuse me, the importance to seek and reduce red tape. But again, no real details around this. Where we have got some um, details is really around the turnover tax for, for micro-businesses. Um, again, straight from the recommendations of the Davis Committee to increase that th uh, the, the, uh, the threshold. Um, currently, the, the, to qualify, your, your turnover needs to be a million rand. That's going to be adjusted, but we're not sure how, by, by how much. But again, a recommendation coming through that the million rand doesn't take you very far in terms of fostering this particular area of the industry. Um, the, the exempt amount is going to be increased from 150 to 350, or oh, sorry, 335,000. Uh, and then the rate is being dropped from effectively from 6% to 5%. Again, being driven towards, you know, where's the engine room of this economy, or where should it be, and is that not where the direction should be going? Uh, again, there's some proposals to ease entry into this particular space, but not, not a lot of details around it. And then the small business corporate relief, uh, tax relief. You know, currently there is a regime that um, um, provides reduced rates for those entities that are not a micro business, but a small business where the turnover is uh, less than 14 million. Here, I think uh, what the policy statement seems to say is that uh, we're going to basically go back um, to the normal taxation for those entities, from what I'm reading. Um, but what will happen here is that there's going to be a credit, a rebate kind of system that's going to apply. Again, quite unique, something quite novel. Um, not sure exactly how it's going to pan out, but my take on this is that if you, uh, if, you go, if you qualify for the parameters, you'll file a normal tax return, submit it, make your payment, and then effectively claim some sort of rebate uh, or, or refund. Let's wait and see what happens. Okay, Good stuff on venture capital, um, certainly in my view. Um, this is one of those uh, in, in, in initiatives that really hasn't been taken on uh, as, as it should be. And uh, it's really to foster two areas. One is um, junior mining and certain non-prohibited uh, type of uh, business activities. 
And again, here, easing up some of the rules, making it a bit more sweeter, um, increasing some of the thresholds um, in, in terms of what are the qualifying requirements to, again, bolster um, uh, development in this particular space. I've only seen one, actually, transaction involving uh, our old 12J. We would certainly like to see a lot more of this happening. And then we know the, the employment uh, tax incentive, the youth wage, uh, whatever you call it, um, has really kick-started kick only uh, beginning of this year. Uh, uh, 56,000 odd beneficiaries, what the minister is saying, have already qualified. The good thing for employers is that previously, if you had uh, a, a credit that you would typically claim against the POIE, um, that credit would roll over. Uh, I think the idea now is that you can actually ca claim any ac excess credit uh, over and above the POI that you've paid as effectively a tax deduction or, or, or a repayment, actually. So again, it's trying to put money back into employees to hopefully then regenerate this particular sector of the industry. And then um, debt deduction rules, um, um, an area, again, that's, been, that's seen a lot of changes, completely revised rules over the past 12 months, 18 months, um, and just trying to ease some anomalies that might arise in circumstances where um, we, we have business rescue situations. Effectively, if you technically read the legislation, you could be, you could be uh, subject to tax if you're actually in a business rescue situation in circumstances where there's a waiver or a, or a reduction of a debt. And, and that just goes against norm, you know, normal principles. Say, but debt companies are already in a business rescue situation. How can you actually get um, them to pay taxes when, when we're trying to, f to facilitate and fix up their, 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 their business. So, again, good stuff in terms of, um, of, of companies in distress. Uh, there's uh, some amendments under the value-added tax. Um, broad statements. Uh, good news is, as we know, no increase in, in VAT. I think people predicted that that wouldn't be the case because of the political sens sensitivities around that. But there was certainly some talk around VAT on some luxury goods, which could have certainly passed, passed muster in terms of the budget which also didn't come through. So I think good news from that particular front. And I think globally, we, our rate is actually on, uh, you know, lower than the, the global average when it comes to that. Broadly, the amendments are, I think, um, two categories, anomalies uh, and fixing up of certain uncertainties, and then some areas of compliance with one big issue arising on the VAT, and that's around the e-commerce. So very quickly around some of the anomalies and, and easing of compliance uh, or, or removing uh, issues of, 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 of dispute on, around documentation. Going concerns, um, we're going to be removing or they're going to be re removing any uncertainty as regards to uh, vendors uh, regarding acquisition of going concerns. A lot of, you know, these are simple things uh, when we're talking about sale of businesses and going concerns. And the anomalies, unfortunately, just overly complicate what, what, would be, what should be simple, simple VAT consequences. Documentations regarding cross-border supplies um, are going to be modernized. Um, tax invoices, debit credit notes. Um, you know, in these instances, the, the, the time limit that would apply for a tax invoice um, would be the normal rules of 21 days. Again, uncertainty in, here, in this area, certainty is going to be provided. And then documentation regarding agents, um, uh, regarding proof of payment of, the, uh, of that, those areas are, again, the, the, the actual documentation that will be required are going to be clarified. Um, contract prices, vendors can repose, uh, can recover Im VAT imposed on supply of certain, um, in, in instances where there's conclusion of certain agreements. And again, here what's going to happen is that the law is going to exclude those who fail to register. This is a bit of an anti-avoidance measure. There was a bit of abuse in this area, um, and this, this amendment is probably going to address that particular abuse. And then zero rating of goods for agricultural, pastoral, and farming purposes. Uh, a bit of uncertainty on this particular area. It's currently zero rated. It seems that they want to move to a standard rated uh, system here. Um, and it, it looks like it's one of those areas that, that's going to be reviewed uh, and something to watch out for. Uh, four monthly VAT cycles are no longer going to be available. You're only going to have a bi monthly cycle. And then there's certain amendments around VAT interest calculations, again, uh, probably to bring it in line with the, t with the TAA. The big one on, around the VAT is really around the e services. We know that last year the announcement was made. Um, for some of, the, some of the, the, the foreign companies supplying services through e-commerce who are escaping tax. It's all over the papers if you just do a Google search. Sorry. Um, uh, um, 
and uh, there's been the legislation that's, uh, that's uh, going to kick in on the first. Uh, there's been a lot of discussions with Treasury, uh, and there's regulations that's going to be promulgated. Essentially, the big issue here is that the broader purpose of this legislation was not necessarily to bring those foreign suppliers into the net where, where you're dealing with business, but really where you're dealing with private transactions. So when we are sitting and downloading uh, you, you know, your, your, your e-books, and that those were the transactions that they really tried to capture. But it seems that the, the, the legislation and the discussions at Treasury seems to want to take this wider than that. And I think that, that is, again, an area that hopefully there will be a lot more development and clarity in the next few months. A lot of good inter interaction between certainly taxpayers, industry, and national treasury, but one that I think uh, everybody will be keenly, keenly waiting for, especially business, because there's a potential for, 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 for almost double that in certain circumstances. All right. Um, let's look at some of the other taxes, then, since we've covered sort of personal tax, uh, corporate tax, and VAT. And we'll quickly go through this carbon tax. Um, Tim mentioned that it's going to be pushed out to 2016. Um, let's wait for, for what happens in the next year. There is a white paper. I think a lot more discussion needs to be had, especially if you look at globally what's happening. Um, and not, uh, you know, many, many, company, many countries like, for example, Germany, Austra Germany uh, Australia, reconsidering whether they should actually implement the, the carbon system. Um, asset mine drainage. Um, an area of obviously great concern, and if you look at asset mine and climate change, a lot around environmental issues. Um, and again, not a lot of detail around those, but looking at ways of making sure that those costs, um, how they're going to be passed back in terms of taxpayers, is going to be subject to, 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 to further discussion. I think the Davis Committee here should play a, a particularly strong hand in terms of making sure that these are all done on a fair and equitable basis. And then my favorite one, some taxes, as you probably know, I don't often go to the bar. Um, and we've got nothing uh, untoward there in terms of, you know, the normal stuff in terms of alcohol as well as um, uh, tobacco increases. So, that was my 15, 20 minutes. I don't know how I'm doing in time, Devin. Uh, but con <laughs> concluding remarks, I think no major uh, shift in policy. Uh, individuals escape increase in marginal rate, which I think is good. Uh, no amendments that really introduce new major taxes, uh, some direction of, 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 of environmental stuff, amendments directed at removing anomalies, um, proposed incentives to really grow the economy. Um, again, we need to look at how that's going to pan out. Six million jobs, medium enterprises, that's where a lot of the talk is and where the, hopefully the amendments will, will, will come through. Um, and then, uh, you know, cost of uh, compliance. Tim mentioned that, uh, single registration, is something that is going to be implemented this year for taxpayers. Let's, let's see what, what, what that comes out. Where are we going to, guys? We, the, 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 the revenue targets don't seem to go down. Ev on average, 10%, we've achieved um, com compounded growth of more than 6.8% 6, 6 since 2008. If you look at just quickly the stats, we're looking at around 10% every year um, um, in terms of collection targets. And I think what that really means is that the economy is clearly not going that strong. And what's going to be important is whether these incentives that are going to be announced are actually going to be implemented. And I think Tim also mentioned implementation is going to be fundamental and key. So that's where the tax is going to come in. If the implementation is right, we should hopefully be on the right path. If not, then I think we're going to constantly be in this position where the economy has been and the GDP is growing at around 2%, economy around 2.5%, yet our targets for revenue are constantly going to be growing at 10%. And I think the final comment is obviously that really is going to involve good engagement, strong engagement between guys like us, guys like you guys, the business community, Treasury and the Davis Committee. And that's really my say, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.